Hello and welcome back to Bun Med where we discuss concise medical knowledge that you can fit inside of a bun. In today's video we're having a look at the antiplatelets following on from our video on the thrombophilias so it makes sense to have a look at how we may go treating uh, one of the thrombophilias. So in this video we'll be covering the various classes of antiplatelets, how they work, when we use them and also uh, what some of the side effects are. So before we get into understanding how do antiplatelet work, um, let's first have a look at exactly how platelets work in primary hemostasis in a lot more depth than we did in our first video. With that said, let's get straight into it. So here you can see we have the inside of an artery. We can see both endothelial uh, cell linings here, but also we can see a ruptured atheroma, this buildup of fatty inflammatory substances underneath our endothelium. Now, when this plaque ruptures, it's going to expose the underlying collagen. And of course, we know in primary hemostasis that von Willebrand's factor is going to come and bind to it first. This is what we've learned in the previous video. Now, we're going to have platelets which are floating about in the nearby area, which is now going to come and bind to our von Willebrand's factor using their GPA1B receptor. So far, so good. This is exactly the stuff we're used to. Here's when the new stuff comes in. So you can see inside of the platelet a lot more now, and we can see that it contains some granules. In green, we can see it contains some dense granules, and in cream, we can see it contains some alpha granules. When our platelet binds to the von Willebrand factor, it, it, it is activated, and this causes the platelet to degranulate, causing some of the dense uh, granules to be released, which contains things like ADP, calcium, and serotonin. Serotonin helps with further vasoconstriction of the blood vessel, thus limiting the amount of blood that's going to escape. Calcium is involved in the clotting cascade. In fact, it's factor four of the clotting cascade, so it's very, very essential for secondary hemostasis. However, it doesn't have um, any huge relevance to antiplatelets, so we're going to ignore these molecules for now. What we are going to focus on, however, is the ADP molecule. And this ADP molecule will float around and bind to the P2Y12 receptor on nearby platelets, causing these platelets to be activated. Now, these activated platelets will then change shape, but will also release more of their own ADP molecule, causing activation of lots and lots of platelets nearby. So you can see how activation of one platelet may lead to the activation of lots and lots of platelets nearby in a chain reaction. So that's one of the ways that we can recruit platelets to the area. How else may our original uh, platelet recruit other platelets to the area? Well, one of the things that happen when our platelet is activated is that the phospholipid bilayer of our platelet is actually broken down. And the resultant product from this is thromboxane A2. Thromboxane A2 actually helps with platelet aggregation, so this is further going to help the platelets clump together in order to form a platelet plug that's going to be able to patch up our hole. And lastly, we're going to have a look at these alpha granules in pink, which, when they degranulate, release things like von Willebrand factor, and as well as that, they release fibrinogen, which goes on binds to the GP2B3A receptor on our platelets. In fact, multiple platelets can bind to these molecules of fibrinogen, really helping to form a strong, stable plaque. So now that we've seen how we might recruit and activate further platelets to the area, we, can, we should also start to think about what might happen if this process goes unchecked. So of course we can see we have an artery here, and we'll say that the blood is indeed coming from the left-hand side over here, and is moving to the end organ on the right-hand side over here. If this process of clotting goes unchecked, what may happen is that we get more and more platelets building up in the area. And as you can see now, we have fully blocked off this artery, meaning that those organs or the tissues distal to this area are no longer getting their oxygen. And as such, may become ischemic or may even die an infarct. This is especially a problem if the tissues distal to this are vital organs, such as our heart or our uh, brain. What's worse is that this thrombus, which is this clump of platelets in the area, may actually become an embolus by breaking off and actually going and occluding a further vessel down the line, causing infarctions or even ischemia further down the line. So now that we know what may happen if the whole process goes unchecked, 
what can we do now that we understand the physiology of the platelets in order to stop these events from occurring? Well, let's break down each of these targets one by one to see how drugs act on these specific targets. So we'll start with the first and one of the most common drugs that we use, which is aspirin. And I'm sure everyone's probably heard of aspirin here or there because it's a very, very old drug. So what class of drug does aspirin fall into? Well, it's actually a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, an NSAID. And if anyone's done a rheumatology before this, it's more than likely we've come across NSAIDs before. So how does aspirin actually function as an antiplatelet? As we said before, when our platelet is activated, the phospholipid bilayer is broken down into arachidonic acid by the action of an enzyme known as phospholipase A2. In this video, I've not included phospholipase A2 on the diagram as aspirin does not exert a big role on it. But just know that there is an enzyme which helps to convert the phospholipid bilayer into arachidonic acid. The arachidonic acid can then be carved and cleaved into thromboxane A2 under the action of the COX-1 or the cyclooxygenase 1 enzyme. And this leads to platelet aggregation. So how does aspirin fit into all of this? Well, aspirin irreversibly binds and blocks the action of the COX-1 enzyme, meaning that we end up producing less thromboxane A2 and as such inhibit how much platelet aggregation actually goes on. So it's fairly straightforward. So when do we actually use aspirin? Well, we use aspirin in mainly uh, arterial thrombotic or embolic events. So things like acute coronary syndromes or in myocardial infarction, when something like one of the art uh, arteries or coronary arteries might get blocked off. By using aspirin, we actually use a quite high dose aspirin initially, around about 300 milligrams. We can actually stop how big the clot is and actually can stop it getting any bigger. We may also use them in things like ischemic strokes when the patient presents after four and a half hours or we don't know when they initially had these symptoms. Or in transient ischemic attacks, which is when an embolus blocks off one of the arteries of the brain but clears spontaneously. And again, when we have a confirmed ischemic stroke or a TIA, we give a high dose of aspirin of around about 300 milligrams to stop um, them clotting further. Lastly, we may also use aspirin in things like stable ischemic heart, heart disease or things like stable angina. And as well as that, we may use it after stabilization of the patient following an MI. And we use a much smaller dose, around about 75 milligrams. So now that we've seen when we use aspirin, what are some side effects associated with aspirin? Well, physiologically, we know we're using aspirin to stop platelets clotting, right? So therefore we're inhibiting primary hemostasis. So the most obvious thing that aspirin could lead to is bleeding or hemorrhaging. And this may present in a various ways, such as nosebleeds, for instance. Other things that aspirin may lead to it being an NSAID, for instance, is things like a rash or an allergic reaction. And this may manifest itself as things like urticaria, which is wheels or these transient swellings that we get over our arms or legs. Or in really severe cases, especially if someone um, is allergic to another NSAID or may have features of things like atopy, this may lead to things like anaphylaxis, leading to swelling of the face, the airway, um, the blockage of the airway due to swelling of the tongue as well. In young children, aspirin should be avoided, especially if they've had a recent viral infection, as it may lead to a condition known as Ray syndrome, which is essentially when following a viral infection, aspirin damages the mitochondria, leading to brain damage, uh, heart damage, but also liver damage as well. So it's a very, very serious condition. In children, aspirin should only be used in indicated cases such as Kawasaki's disease. Finally, we also have to consider what are the other roles of the COX-1 enzyme? Well, in our stomach, the COX-1 enzyme actually helps us to produce prostaglandins, which encourages mucus secretion in the stomach. This mucus is actually used to protect our stomach and protect our stomach lining uh, from the stomach acid itself. If we are blocking the COX-1 enzyme for a long time, we are actually reducing the amount of um, mucus that we produce to coat our stomach. And as such, the stomach acid may erode away at our stomach, giving us things like peptic ulcer disease. Or we may even see a worsening of peptic ulcer disease.
Finally, in very, very rare cases, if our arachidonic acid is not being converted into things like thromboxane A2 because we are blocking off the Cox enzyme, the arachidonic acid may go down a separate pathway and be formed into pro-inflammatory molecules like lipoxins, which may actually cause things such as acute asthma or bronchospasms. So that's aspirin, a fairly straightforward drug, but a lot of side effects to just be aware of. Okay, so what about our next group of drugs? Well, our next group of drugs is our P2Y12 inhibitors. So what drugs fall into this category? We have a very older fashion drug known as clopidogrel, a newer fashion drug known as ticagrelor, and a quite new uh, type of drug known as prasugrel. So how do they work? Well, here you can see we have a platelet, and in blue we have the P2Y12 uh, receptor, which when activated will activate our platelets. As the name suggests, P2Y12 uh, inhibitors irreversibly bind to and block the action of the P2Y12 uh, receptor. As a result, we stop ADP from binding to the P2Y12 receptor and thus stop uh, further platelet activation. So when do we actually use these drugs? Well, firstly, let's have a look at clopidogrel. It used to be in the older days, we would use clopidogrel uh, alongside aspirin in cases like acute coronary syndromes or myocardial infarctions, we, where we use an initially quite high dose, like 300 milligrams. And we also use clopidogrel in things like transient ischemic attacks, or two weeks after a stroke, or in peripheral vascular disease, where we use a much smaller dose of around about 75 milligrams. Again, this is a preventative dose to stop um, thrombi forming in these conditions, and it's not directly dealing with a thrombus that has already formed. What about ticagrelor? Well, ticagrelor seemed to have replaced clopidogrel in terms of use alongside aspirin in ACS and MI. And in fact, it is now the first line drug to be used in a case of an acute coronary syndrome or an MI alongside aspirin. And this is the slightly odd, odd one where we use a dose of 180 milligram one-off, not 300 milligrams one-off. Following this, we actually continue the uh, ticagrelor for around about 12 months, especially if the patient has had a percutaneous coronary intervention, which is essentially when we send a tube up the patient's radial artery in an effort to open up the coronary artery that is blocked off by a thrombus. So what kind of side effects may we uh, expect from P2Y12 inhibitors? Again, if we think about it physiologically, their whole role is to stop the activation of platelets. So therefore, of course, that's going to be a bleeding risk. In fact, clopidogrel has a higher bleeding risk than ticagrelor, which is why ticagrelor is now preferred over clopidogrel. So one of the things that we may notice is things like nosebleeds. Other things that we may notice with any drugs, not just um, P2Y12 inhibitors, is things like allergic reactions or rashes, nausea, vomiting, sometimes constipation. Very quick tip, if you're ever inside of an OSCE and you're asked, name a few side effects, nausea, vomiting, rash, usually will pick you up one or two points. And finally, let's have a look at the very, very new class of drugs, the GP2B3A inhibitors. Now, honestly, we don't need to know a huge deal uh, of information about these drugs as they are quite specialist, but it's really good to have a just understanding of how they work, um, when we use it, and why we may not use it at times. So what drugs fall into this category? Well, we have eptifibatide, tarofiban, and also abciximab, quite unusual name. So if you see an unusual name in, a, in an exam paper um, and it's an antiplatelet, it's probably related to one of the GP2B3A inhibitors. So how do they work? Well, here we can see we have a platelet. Let's just have a look at what the role of that GP2B3A receptor actually is. So here you can see we have a platelet. And here you can see the platelet binding to fibrinogen using its GP2B3A receptor. In fact, what we notice is that lots and lots of platelets can bind to the same molecule of fibrinogen using their GP2B3A receptor, helping to form this really nice, strong and stable plaque. When we use a GP2B3A inhibitor like eptifibatide, for instance, it actually goes and blocks the receptor and as a result, we stop the platelet binding to fibrinogen. And as a result, we prevent the aggregation of platelets and thus the formation of a platelet plug. So when do we actually use GP2B3A inhibitors? 
Well, we use them again in things like acute coronary syndromes such, uh, or myocardial infarctions, especially if the patient is about to undergo a PCI, which is the percutaneous coronary intervention. We may also use it in things like unstable angina or non-ST elevation myocardial infarction to stop these diseases progressing into an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Now, if what I'm saying isn't making much sense right now, don't worry. A lot of this is cardiology rather than hematology. And the following videos to come over the next couple of weeks will actually focus on how they work in the cardiovascular system. And this will make a lot more sense later on. So when do we actually not use our GP2B3A inhibitors and what are some side effects? Well, the biggest one with these guys is bleeding. And as a result, all of the contraindications actually are focused around this theme of bleeding. So we can't use a GP2B3A inhibitor if the patient has had a hemorrhagic stroke in the last uh, few months. As well as that, we can't use them if the patient has an intracranial neoplasm, which is a tumor in the brain, which may bleed and actually cause uh, more brain damage. So it may do more damage than good. We can't use them if the patient has a very high INR or a very variable INR. And lastly, we can't use them if the patient has had trauma or major surgery in the last six weeks as their risk of bleeding is again quite high. So in this slide, I have just summarized uh, a very quick uh, way to just work out what antiplatelets are used, at what dose they're used and when they're used. Um, if you don't understand these, there's no point of trying to memorize them at the moment. You will get to know these a lot more as you're going through the cardio topics. Feel free to pause the video now and take a screenshot uh, if it helps you remember, but this is much more of a cardio topic than a hematology topic. So just to sum up, today we've seen exactly how, uh, in a much more greater detail, how platelets actually come to bind together, how they degranulate, and knowing that we've actually worked out how we may go about manipulating this process to stop these developing into a serious condition. So we've seen we can actually inhibit things like thromboxane A2 and stop platelet aggregation using aspirin, or we can stop platelet activation using P2Y12 inhibitors, so things like clopidogrel, ticagrelo, and prosagrel. And lastly, we could see that before, an, um, before a PCI, or even before things like, uh, when we have things like an acute coronary syndrome or a non-ST elevated myocardial infarction, we can stop these developing into an ST elevation myocardial infarction using things like GP2B3A inhibitors, such as eptifibatide, abciximab, and tirofibam. Thank you very much. That concludes the video. I hope you guys found this useful. If you have any questions, as always, leave it in the comments below. I'll try to get back to them as soon as possible.